Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food. I'm going to say that again. It's all about food. I've been doing this podcast since 2009, and the title of this podcast never ceases to amaze me because most things I talk about all come down to food somehow. And that's not just the deliciousness of food and the desire for food and the hunger for food, but the politics of food and the disparity and the distribution and the impact on the environment and certainly the impact on the other species that we share this planet with that we're not very nice to, but then we're not very nice to each other either. <laughs> but that's another story. Right. And there, there's just so many things we can talk about when it comes to food. And probably my most favorite thing to talk about is nutrition and how we can make the most of these physical bodies we're in while we're here on this planet, currently our home earth. And so today, we're all going to meet Dr. John E. Lewis, PhD, with over 180 peer-reviewed publications and extensive research experience. Dr. John Lewis, founder and president of Dr. Lewis Nutrition, is a trusted authority in his field. His studies on the effects of nutrition, dietary supplementation, and exercise on various aspects of human health include his groundbreaking findings surrounding the importance of polysaccharides for brain health and immune function, which have led to breakthroughs with Alzheimer's, MS, HIV, and various chronic diseases. John, welcome to It's All About Food. Thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm like you. I, I think about Life just almost exactly the way you do, the way you described it. Obviously, you were at a very high level, but if you think about all those different topics and how relevant they are to literally every cell in our body, it's absolutely true. Everything from the politics of food to the environmental impacts of food to, like you just said, the way we treat other animals. That's why I have eaten a plant-based diet for going on 27 years. Okay, that was my first question. You kind of just answered it, but... <laughs> 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 I I read in your bio that you're whole food plant based, and I wanted to know how that started. So it's been 27 years for you. Was it a book? Was it a person? Was it looking up at the sky or looking into the eyes of an animal? What was it for you? That's a great question. Uh, have you heard of Robert Cohen, the guy that does notmilk.com? I do. Okay, I know so... him personally. Okay. Well, that that's... And, and I don't want I don't want to say anything more about that, but I do remember oh. his not milk. And actually, I might go into a little bit more, but you tell me your story first. My story is simply that I felt like I needed to change my nutrition. I I started out looking at nutrition from a very sp specific purpose, and that was I got into drug free competitive bodybuilding um, in, in college, I played sports when I was a kid and I loved the, the competition aspects of playing sports. And after all of that ended, then I looked for something else and I was always a very skinny kid. Hmm. And so I started weightlifting and my body really responded to it, to the tune of gaining like 60 pounds in about a two year period, which I had wow. all sorts of people. Yeah. I mean, it like, like really responded just a very fast gainer. And I even had people accusing me of being on steroids and other drugs. And I was like, well, <laughs> I guess in a way that's kind of a backhanded compliment, but, but I'm not, and I never did. But anyway, I, as I, as I got out of bodybuilding, uh, because I realized I couldn't be a competitive bodybuilder and, and work for a living. And I was never going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger and make, make a living off of bodybuilding. So I realized I needed to do something else in life, use my mind rather than my body. But it also shifted me into thinking of nutrition from a sports performance perspective to much more of a health perspective. And I don't think anybody would say that bodybuilding is necessarily the healthiest thing in the world for you to do in terms of getting yourself all the way down to, you know, three or 4% fat. That's not, not really a healthy pursuit just in addition to just how stressful that lifestyle can be in terms of regimenting, not just your training, but everything. I mean, you have to be 
And I will give those guys credit. Even if they are doing drugs, they still have to be incredibly regimented. So it takes a lot of emotional, mental, physical strength to do that. So I, my appreciation is deep for those guys, whether they do drugs or not, I couldn't care less. But anyway, <laughs> as I, as I shifted into a health focus and I started wondering about many different things that I didn't learn in graduate school in nutrition. I mean, nobody and none of my professors were teaching the vegan lifestyle to health or, you know, anything like that. I, I learned on a very practical level about cellular physiology and, and how the cells utilize nutrients and whatnot. So I didn't, this was nothing that I learned from many of my professors with all due respect to them. I had some amazing professors, but it had nothing to do with them. But because I grew up Southern and, and my dad thought a meal was not a meal without three components, a glass of milk, a piece of bread, and some kind of beef. And literally, <laughs> he he did not think a meal was a meal without those three components. And well, I Well, that's in, kind of part of the standard American diet and why chronic disease is soaring. Right. That's right, yeah. exactly. And my, in fact, not just dad, I mean, I bless his heart. I, I can't, you know, it's not just him. I mean, my whole family, we ate for taste, not for health. I didn't have any models in my family of health either. It was just, you know, we ate for, for taste, not for, oh, well, let's think about how this meal impacts our, uh, our cells or anything. But anyway, I had a very good friend of mine from childhood say, this is all the way back to like, I think 99 or 2000. So this is many years ago. He introduced me to um, notmilk.com. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's maybe 97, I'm thinking. I, yeah. I wonder it's, it's been a long time ago. Yeah. He, he introduces me to notmilk.com, and I started reading all of these summaries of, of this, uh, the articles that Cohen had posted on his site. And then I went beyond the summaries and started reading the whole articles. And then suddenly, you know, it took me a little while, but I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm killing myself eating this cheese, drinking this milk you know, taking all this stuff from cow's breast fluid, it was like very profound yep. that I went down this line of thinking about how damaging that, what we think of from due to the mass media, you know, nature's perfect food, got milk, you know, all these creative advertisements you used to see. I don't see too much of that anymore. It seems like either they've shifted their advertising in other ways or whatever they've done, but I don't see that as much on the media anymore, but nonetheless, uh, it just completely changed my perspective on milk and, and any dairy product. And so it was really, you know, and I don't think a lot of people, I mean, most people, when they decide to do something, if you decide to do it cold Turkey, I think there are probably a few people who can do stuff like that, but I chose at that time to say, okay, well, it's not just dairy. It's actually anything from an animal. Let me start reading more science and learn about how this is an Im uh, impacting or affecting my health and my performance on a cellular level. And so I just made a very conscious decision to say, okay, I'm done with animal tissue of, of all kind. I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. But I gave myself about a six month period to, to make that change as opposed to just, you know, a cold Turkey kind of change where that may or may not have been the best strategy, but over a six month period, I just decided to cut it all out. And that's what I did. And that's been over a quarter of a century ago. It's um, hard I'm applauding you. It's funny, too, how we use the expression cold turkey talking about <laughs> right. eliminating animals from our diet. Right. But, <laughs> right. But that's what we do. I'm intrigued because just a little bit about my background. I've been vegan for 35 years and vegetarian for longer. And it was just, Beautiful. you know, one of these things. I didn't want to kill animals as a teenager. And then I learned more and and dairy was one of those, the real enlightenment, I think, because as a vegetarian, you can eat dairy and eggs, but then you realize dairy is probably the worst. And now when I talk to people about diet, I say dairy needs to go first. It's That's the right. worst. Tragic. I grew up in New York and I roamed around the world and I came back to New York around mm -hmm. 1996 and I started an EarthSave chapter here, and I was executive director of EarthSave. Now, EarthSave was oh, nice. a nonprofit organization founded by John Robbins, who wrote the best-selling right. book, Diet for New America, back in 1987. And then he started all these chapters, and um, I had the one in New York in addition to managing the, the country's chapters. And I decided to have my first event. It was supposed to be in, it was supposed to be September 12th. 2001. Oh, wow. Oh, 
<laughs> oh, and no. and I had chosen a location, a restaurant down in the lower part of Manhattan. And I remember when the buildings were falling, I was trying to reach the restaurant and say, can I still have my event tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and Howard Lyman, the uh, mad cowboy, yes, was supposed to be my first guest. He was on the board of Earth Save at the time. And, and that got canceled. So then the next month, I'm trying to start this up again because I really want to get these monthly dinner lectures going and start teaching people about healthy plant diets and get right. the mission going. And everything in Manhattan at that time was reduced because nobody was going out, nobody was doing anything. So I managed to get a great deal <laughs> at Trump Tower on Fifth wow. Avenue in the wow. atrium. Wow. Now, I don't like saying that word. I am... Um, not a fan of of that man who mm -hmm. owns that building. But at the time, it was a great space. I got a great deal. I managed to arrange with the people who did the catering in the atrium to do a complete vegan spread. And Robert wow. Cohen, he was my first speaker. Nice. <laughs> and uh, we were friends and colleagues at the time. And he was very helpful in attending a lot of my events and his information was excellent, and he's a very smart man. Um, I don't want to go further, but there were there were personality conflicts sure. <laughs> after that. And I really haven't heard much anything from him in probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years. But he did make his mark about dairy and got a lot of attention, and that's a good thing. He did, and and like you, I you know, I didn't really get to know him um, very well on a personal level. I mean, we exchanged some uh, communication over the years, but then he kind of, I guess, where he and I would would definitely have a falling out is I do believe in dietary supplements. I think, especially based on the research that I conducted at the University of Miami while I was there full time, I believe dietary supplements can be very beneficial. And he was always you know, pounding the table about how bad dietary supplements were. And I'm like, well, in my opinion, it's a very ignorant statement because you're just throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You're, you're claiming everything is bad and that's not true. So, and I never wanted to get into an argument with him because I saw him argue with other people. And I just, I'm kind of the personality type. I don't look for arguments. I have no interest in arguments, drama, conflict. I avoid it. My, my strategy for or disagreeing with people is just to say, that's fine. That's your opinion. I have mine. Let's just choose to part ways on that. And I don't, I have no interest yeah. in converting people or anything else. I support conversations. They can be lively. People don't have to agree, but if we're discussing facts and points of view, as long as it doesn't get confrontational and egotistical. Right. It's good and, and necessary. Okay, so I think we're going to talk about supplements. So now we know about you and how you got started. And I, I'm i I'm applauding you again. Thank you. You know, a By lot way, of people- but I'm sorry oh. to interrupt you. I was just want to say before we move on, I have given several lectures over the years to the Earth Save Miami chapter. Okay, I know them well. Yes. Jeff Tucker. I know him well. Yes. I yeah. couldn't believe he moved to Georgia. I, I was shocked to hear he moved to, I think it's Bainbridge. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, you know, we all need a change. <laughs> I <guess so. laughs> yeah, I spoke at the Earth State Miami chapter a number of times. Excellent. I'm yeah. sorry we missed each other. I wanted to just add one more thing about becoming vegan, plant-based. There are people that do it all the time, fortunately, and they're learning, fortunately. And it's just always amusing to me because we all have our own personal timelines and our discovery is real in the moment. When people do it today, they have no idea what it was like to do it 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago because right. things have changed so much and it's become so easy. And we're not looked upon as crazy anymore. It's right. almost mainstream, dare I say. It's not a trend. It's here to stay. <laughs> it's the only way that's going to save humanity. That's right. So there's that. So you studied nutrition and you're plant-based, vegan. Thank you. Where are you today? 
And what have you learned in the 27 years? I have learned over the years. I, I just had one of my best friends, he and his wife were down over the weekend and he keeps, he keeps telling me, John, you need to start the healthiest man in the world con uh, podcast because he said, I don't know anybody healthier than you. And so I've learned over the years that being plant-based and I look at my friends from high school and a lot of, several of them have already died, unfortunately. Yep. And a lot of them do not look well. They're on medications for all these different things that you already mentioned. We have all of these epidemics and chronic disease. And I just, it breaks my heart when I see these guys that used to be healthy when we were all, you know, kids or young adults. And now fast forward 30 something years later, and a lot of them are just not, they're struggling very badly. So I've learned that when you stop eating the tissue of other beings, you actually are, you're not only doing a lot of things for the outside world, but you're doing a lot for your internal environment. That's the, that's the biggest takeaway that I have of being plant-based all of these years. And the other thing I'd like to tell our listeners is, I, and I, I can imagine you feel the same way, I don't consider there to be anything special about myself. I am a very motivated person. And when I choose to do something, I mean, unless it's like a natural disaster or, you know, something else, I'm going to do it. It may, you know, I may, and I'm not the most brilliant person either, but <laughs> when I choose to do something, I will do it. And so I tell people all the time, look, I grew up in a household of eating a very typical uh, Southern American diet. If I can make changes to not eat beef and, and dairy every day, anybody can. It's just a matter of, do you want to? If you just tell me, John, I love my ice cream. I love my glass of milk. I love my hamburger. I don't care. I'm just going to eat it anyway. Well, then, you know, more power to you. Good luck. I can't, I can't help you there. But if, like you said, if you, if somebody can have an open mind and listen to science, and I know that science is very dependent on who's funding it. So I just had, a, I was lecturing up in Orlando last weekend, and I was talking about the problems associated with eating animal tissue specifically related to different cancers and heart disease. And I had a guy, and these were all chiropractors, and I had a guy <laughs> sitting in the front row. And as soon as I get started giving my lecture, it was an hour and 40 minutes, a very long lecture. He had this smirk on his face. And I said, okay, here's my contrarian. I knew it. You know, you can just, <laughs> you can mm -hmm. sense it. And <clears throat> when I started talking about some of these mechanisms associated with red and processed meat and colorectal cancer, you know, he raises his hand and then he starts giving me pushback. Well, you know, you realize a lot of those studies are based on people eating McDonald's, not people eating real meat, whatever that means. And mm -hmm. I just said, sir, I said, I'm not here to argue. I'm just presenting you the science that I've found and that this is published information. This isn't my opinion. This is published, peer-reviewed published information. So you take it however you want to. And then later in the later in the lecture, he he balked at my description of milk as being cow's breast fluid. He thought I was using that term to to generate an emotional response. And I said, well, is that is that true? Is it cows? Is it is it breast fluid from a cow? I said, all mammals, all female mammals make milk. How is that not true? Well, you're right there, but you know, it's still an emotional way of talking about milk. And he just went on and on and on. And I just said, sir, I'm not here to argue. And then I actually had a couple of people after the lecture come up to me and say, wow, you handled that guy with class. You know, that was, I'm glad you didn't stoop to his level and start an argument or anything. So, you know, again, it's, I've learned a lot of things, but I think it's very important for us, as you said, when we started this conversation to understand, it's not just about I'm hungry, let me get something to eat. It's about how every time you have that sensation and what you do after that and how you fulfill that hunger, what does that mean? Not only for your internal environment, but how that affects everything else in the world. And it does trickle up because obviously we have 43% of our country now is either overweight or obese, just unreal numbers of overweight and obesity. Heart disease is still the leading killer. Cancer is still number, if it's, if heart disease is 1A, cancer is 1B, like they're that close. Uh, how many people now have mood disorder? I've never seen so many depressed and anxious people today. Diabetes is through the roof. We've got 20 million Americans with diabetes. I think 90% of those are type two. Then we've got like another 100 million that have metabolic syndrome that are on the way to diabetes or heart disease or both. Bone disease, liver disease, kidney disease. I mean, it's just relentless what we've done to ourselves and all this can come back 
to what we do when we open our mouths, bend our elbow, and put something in it. It's all about food. It is, completely. I even presented data showing if you're overweight or obese and you think exercise is your number one strategy to losing weight, forget it. You can't <laughs> possibly exercise enough to make that weight loss sustainable that you will not be overweight at some point and then keep it off. It's 99 times out of 100, it comes back to food. Amen. I'm we sorry if I if I got a little bit on my soapbox there. No, what boggles my mind, I only understand the way I think. It's the only mind I'm inside of. I don't know how anybody else thinks, but I cannot understand. Well, just like that person you were describing at the lecture you were giving, this person does not want to hear certain information. It is emotional no. for them. And they've had blinders on. Just right. like when you were talking earlier about your nutrition education and the professors, they have blinders on. There's things that they just don't want to know. And that's an interesting thing about humanity. And maybe it's something that has <clears throat> enabled our survival somehow, but it's it's also very detrimental. Denial yeah, think... is not just a river in Egypt, and we are so that's good right. at denial. The other thing I told that gentleman that I could tell I really got his mind to sort of um, reconsider was I said, sir, if any at point in humans evolution did we need to survive off of the breast fluid of another species, we never would have made it. <laughs> we never would have made it. We wouldn't be here today. That yeah. was I got that close to almost starting an argument that way. I, I could feel I could feel okay. my emotions, you know, coming up just a little bit. And then I say, OK, John, that's enough. Like. And <laughs> don't go any more there. Yeah, you're smart. We have to focus on the people that are open to the message. And then through through some increase in, in the people doing this, we gain momentum. And, and there's that snowball effect that I hope for. Me too. So we're eating a healthy diet. What does that look like to you on the plate? And then what is it deficient in where supplements may come in handy? Well, that's a great question. I I try to, the easiest way, and I, I know I'm not the only person doing this. I know a lot of people talk about colors, right? Like the easiest way to get the average person. Eat the rainbow. Skin, eat the rainbow, exactly. Just eat as many different colors as you can. So that's what I try to do every day with being just, you know, very generic because my diet changes pretty much every day. I mean, I maybe the only thing roughly every day that stays the same is brown rice. I, I'm a big fan of brown rice. But I mean, everything else, you know, it could be beans, it could be lentils, it could be tofu, it could be a veggie burger, it's different types of greens, nuts, seeds, I mean, you name it, fruits, I'm just all over the place. So I don't, I anything that Mother Nature provides is about the only thing I don't care to eat is Brussels sprouts. I never acquired a taste for Brussels sprouts, <laughs> <laughs> but I love the heck out of cauliflower and and I'm sorry, asparagus, not Brussels sprouts. I'm oh. not a big fan of asparagus, but okay. cauliflower, broccoli, you know, any kind of leafy green, romaine, kale, spinach, chard, you name it, I'll eat it. I, I don't really have any problem there. Um, I don't, you know, I, and when we think of deficiencies, I, I don't like to lump us plant people into that category because it's clearly not just us plant people. 70% of Americans have either insufficient or deficient levels of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Right. So yep. vitamin We're all D, inside. Yep. That's right. So vitamin D is not a plant people problem. It's a, it's a people problem. And as I like to tell people, I mean, if you don't live in South Florida, like I do, then maybe you're in the Northern latitudes, like, you know, in New York or Minnesota or Montana or whatnot, you probably don't have as much opportunity to get sun exposure, but vitamin D3 from uh, algae or lichens, I mean, there's been vita, uh, vegan D3 products on the market for quite a while now, they're cheap. There's absolutely no sense for us to have 70% of Americans not at a sufficient level of vitamin D. And one of, the, one of the lectures I just gave, I was doing some homework on vitamin D. I, I think this was about 10 years ago, it was like 2,700 genes when I just, saw a new article that was updated on this. It was now over 4,000 of our 35, 40,000 genes, whatever we have, 4,000 genes have already been identified as having vitamin D affect them. Wow. So this is a critically important 
it's not even a vitamin, right? It's actually a pro-hormone, but it's critically important to our well-being, not just for our bones, but for everything to have a sufficient amount of vitamin D. And of course, that 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 level is even debatable. You know, some people say it should be about 60. I got a very good friend who's a pharmacist. He says he keeps his over 100. He's vitamin D fanatic. So, you know, it, <laughs> at that yeah. level, it's hard to say what is actually optimal. But nonetheless, if you're below 30 and if you're below 20, you're in bad shape. And it's going to affect you in many different ways. So vitamin D is something that, you know, I tell people that's a major problem. B12, of course, we think of that for vegans, plant-based people as being an issue. I take a B, uh, a B complex every day. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not the person that believes that just eating a good diet is sufficient. I think that may help you prevent rickets and scurvy and, and things of, you know, a hundred years ago that people used to be really afflicted with. But that's just being like, you know, that's the RDI is based on that type of thought. It's not based on optimizing health. It's based on preventing these nutritionally deficient diseases. And so I don't, that to me is not the goal that we should be shooting for. We want to optimize our health. We don't want to just get by, right? Right. And the- Everybody <clears throat> should probably supp supplement with B12 just because we live in such a sterile society. And as we age, right. it gets, gets harder to absorb it. So we all need it. And it's so easy and there's no known- a uh, toxic level to take none it's pretty safe and you take the if you have the mthr uh, allele in your gene where you have issues with methylating then take the methyl cobalamin and it's there's no difference really in price between the methyl or the cyano or some of the other forms but take the methylated version so that way if you have that allele uh, I know I don't remember the percentage of people that have that. I think it's maybe 30 or 40 percent of the population that has issues with methylating. So just take the methylated version of, of B12 and you're OK. Your body can absorb it. The, I uh, don't I don't take too many supplements myself. I take Dr. Furman's multivitamin. I take vitamin D in addition to that. And uh, a occasion, I kind of add a B12 sublingual once a week. and I take a, a liquid DHA, EPA, and that's that's all that I do personally. I want to mention that I did have advanced ovarian cancer 17 years ago. And at that time, with the chemotherapy, I went to an integrated cancer facility where they, it, it was actually a wonderful experience. Shout out to Dr. Keith Block in Illinois. Nice. Um, but I was taking like a thousand dollars of uh, nutraceuticals every month wow. in addition to my, my, uh, chemo treatment. And I, I'm here today. I don't have the data, but I believe it made a significant difference. I, I didn't throw up. I didn't have intense nausea. It was a, a relatively pleasant experience other than fatigue. Uh, so there were a lot of things that I was taking then. I don't take them now, but in that moment, they were really important. So, absolutely. Well, depending on I, the individual and the need, they can supplements can make a, a positive difference. Well, if I if I may, let me tell you what's really besides being plant based in general, what's really near and dear to my heart is the research that my colleagues and I conducted over, and we're, actually we're still doing it because we're still writing papers from. The clinical trials, even though I'm no longer full time in academics, but we, I was very lucky, you know, fortunate, fate, whatever you believe in, that I met two people who completely changed my life about polysaccharides. And uh, one of them who's still alive, he's going on 88 this year, guy still goes to his office every day, a pathologist by training who doesn't run a pathology unit, he practices nutrition because he was introduced to the benefits of these polysaccharides from aloe vera close to 40 years ago. And I met him, his name is Dr. Reg McDaniel. I met him about 20 years ago. He was the first person that changed my life. And then I met a lady, a, a cancer survivor from here at the University of Miami, who was taking this rice brand product. Now, her name was Barbara Kimley. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us, but Barbara changed the course of my life with her introduction. And, and so these two particular polysaccharides are very, very special. 
Um, it's beyond, I think, biochemistry. Actually, I think there's something on a physics level why these things are so effective. But if you look at the work that we've published, and I and I have summarized a lot of this on uh, our website, and I have, of course, the articles that we've published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, I, I would put these particular compounds up against just about anything else that Mother Nature provides for us. And I, I, I really would. And I don't know anybody who eats aloe vera. And even if you did, the gel is 99% water. So <clears throat> you'd have to drink bucket or eat whatever you suck, you know, however you'd consume this, this uh, gel, you'd have to consume bucket loads of it to get any kind of a concentrated amount of the polysaccharides to have a therapeutic benefit. Same thing with the rice bran. Most of the world, I think like 70, 80% of the world eats white rice. And so when the when the rice is milled, when it's brought in from the field, it goes to the milling. The uh, the husk, of course, that's the, you know, the the outer shell that we can't consume because it's inedible. Then the bran is underneath the husk. The bran gets stripped off and then it's either thrown away as well or fed to livestock. And then what's left over is that white endosperm. And that's what the world refers to as white rice. But even if you were eating like me, brown rice every day, I still wouldn't be getting enough concentration of those polysaccharides to have a therapeutic benefit. But man, we, I mean, we, our, our trials using these polysaccharides, whether it was in people with Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, um, HIV, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, over this 20 year period, we just, we just published some incredible data that I mean, I hope I don't sound too arrogant about this, but just blow <laughs> basically anything else away that you can think of in terms of the efficacy, especially for something like Alzheimer's. I don't know if you've had any family members or yes. friends. or So you know how ter terrible and tragic this disease is. But with our formulation, we showed clinically and statistically significant improvements in cognitive function at 9 and 12 months, according to ADAS-COG which is the gold standard for assessing cognition, uh, particularly among, among people with different forms of dementia. And then we showed an increase in the CD14, I'm sorry, the, the CD4 to CD8 ratio, which is very important, not just for people with Alzheimer's, but for all of us, because that's your ratio of helper to cytotoxic cells. And you want that ratio to be high. And as we age many times, that ratio tends to go down and that's very, very bad for us. We showed a lowering of TNF-alpha and VEGF, which are inflammatory markers commonly looked at in cardiovascular disease and different forms of cancer. Our first paper was probably the first paper that ever showed that type of change uh, in people with Alzheimer's. And then we also showed just under a 300% increase in adult stem cells, according to CD14 cells. We know that not through our research, but through other labs around the world, that CD14s can turn into neurons. So neuroplasticity is a concept that's generally recognized today. 30 or 40 years ago, people didn't think the brain could regenerate itself. We thought that at birth, you're born with a number of neurons and then that's it. And if you damage them with, you know, smoking or alcohol or whatever, then you just lose them. But no, the brain actually has the capacity, just like the rest of our body, to regenerate itself. And so those were just incredible findings we published in the first paper from that study, we've published subsequently three other papers from that study. And the last one we just published at the end of last year, we showed a rebalancing that the Th1 to Th2 components of our immune system are very crucial because they're, they're generally speaking, the components that keep our pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory um, components in balance. And we, when I first had the idea to publish this or to look at this, I went to PubMed, I'm doing my lit search, I'm trying to find other information in, in this population. I could not find one other paper that had done this. Not one other paper had characterized these Th1 to Th2 ratios in people with Alzheimer's disease. So I was like, wow, that's that's cool. I mean, I, you know, in, in a way it could have mm -hmm. been, a, uh, you know, difficult, but it made it like a real nice opportunity. So what we ended up showing was how incredibly Th1 dominant people with Alzheimer's are. We had another data set of healthy people where we were able to compare the ratios between the two. The Alzheimer's people had these really high ratios. The healthy people had scores that were basically like around 1.0. I mean, very, very stark differences. Then we showed over the 12-month intervention, taking our 
our dietary supplement that um, they were rebalanced. They didn't get all the way back to one, but at least they were going in that direction, five out of six of them. And then the cherry on top of the cake was that the rebalancing of the immune system was correlated with better cognitive function. So we've just shown over this period of nearly 20 years now, these different papers where you put all this information together and you can see these relationships between the cognitive function, which is obviously a proxy for brain function, and then all these different immune function and inflammatory markers and how they talk to each other. And so I want people to understand that the immune system is not just our first line of defense against infection, virus, bacteria, fungus, whatever. It's actually way more sophisticated than that. It actually is like the conductor of the symphony orchestra. It's constantly talking to all of our other major organ systems and it's helping to keep everything else in balance. And so if your immune system is not doing that, we refer to immunosenescence being a term where we describe the immune system, you know, faltering or losing its ability over time as we age. But if we can enhance that, and which we've now showed with our allopolysaccharide based dietary supplement, we can actually improve that. And I didn't mention that these pe these folks didn't just have Alzheimer's, they had depression, diabetes, mm -hmm. different forms of heart disease. And oh, by the way, they were also on average 79.9 years of age. So these wow. were re really mm -hmm. old folks that had this terrible disease plus other things. And we were able to get them to do things that in many cases they hadn't done for years. I mean, I had, I had caregivers as we were running the study, I had caregivers calling me in tears saying, uh, Dr. Lewis, I can't believe what my wife or my husband or, you know, whatever the relationship was, is, is she or he is doing things, talking about things that in some cases hadn't been done for years. So it was a very powerful emotional experience for me to not only do a good job running the study and, you know, being a good scientist, but actually seeing how this stuff could benefit somebody with this tragic disease. And let me also pause right there and say that I don't want anybody to say that Lewis said he's using nutrition to cure disease or treat disease or manage disease. This is way more powerful than that. And I know FTC and FDA or, you know, they'll frown on you for talking about disease claims, but I'm not talking about disease claims. What I'm talking about is that these polysaccharides and other the other nutrients in this formulation provide the information to the genes to tell the cells what to do. And that's a way more powerful paradigm than taking one chemical in a disease context and then altering a metabolic pathway to try to treat a symptom of that disease. That's like a sniper rifle, whereas nutrition is like a shotgun where you need all these nutrients and all these elements at the same time for our cells to function properly. But the genes do nothing until they receive information from the environment, which typically is through what we put into our mouths. And that is that is why food is so powerful because that information, again, is taken in by our genes and then tells our cells what to do. And oh, by the way, these polysaccharides are such dense uh, molecules. They have much more information coded in them then say, for example, amino acids and fatty acids, even mm -hmm. though, you know, we know that those things are essential, we have to get some of those from our diet. But these polysaccharides, where the, if you look inside just a representation of one cell, you have the, the mitochondria, of course, most people have heard of the mitochondria being the engine of our cells that, pr that, that produces ATP that allows our cells to function. But these other organ organelles that are, they're called, so from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi, where these things are, they're very involved in creating different, uh, bio, let's call them bioactive molecules. So whether it's putting together uh, saccharides and amino acids or saccharides and fatty acids, and then what that does is then it's like a construction line, right? It's, it's like this assembly line where you're putting these things together, and then it's either allowing the cell to create a new cell, replicate itself, talk to another cell, create some other, again, compound like a, like a cytokine or a growth factor that's like a signaling mechanism mm -hmm. to tell other cells what to do. So all these polysaccharides from aloe vera and rice bran are so intricately involved in all those processes. And that's the reason why these things are so powerful and so efficacious for us. And that's the reason why I'm such a believer in polysaccharides, because I don't know anybody who eats aloe vera. And again, even if you did, you couldn't possibly get enough polysaccharide content from your, your your aloe vera in your backyard. And and again, going back to the rice bran story, same thing there too. You can't possibly eat enough white, uh, or I'm sorry, brown rice 
to get that polysaccharide content on a daily basis to help your body sustain itself. So I just, you know, I'll, I'll, I guess I'm, if I would argue with somebody about anything, it would be arguing about the benefit of dietary supplements in certain cases where you need to go above and beyond what food provides you to really optimize your health. So just going to take a minute here. I'm speaking with Dr. John E. Lewis, and I hope you can hear the intense passion <laughs> and extreme knowledge that he has for the way our bodies work. And I'm glad you're doing the work you're doing, and it sounds indeed very exciting. Our medical community, unfortunately, for m most of its history, has been treating symptoms and not working to make our bodies as efficient as possible to give us a quality life and a, a longevity. And that's a, I hope that's changing, but that's where we are at the moment. You mentioned a number of things. It's funny, uh, when I was going through my romp with cancer, I was looking for, I was doing a lot of reading to try and figure out what I needed to do. And an integrative approach was definitely necessary. But I did, for a while, drink aloe vera juice. Nice. <laughs> Fantastic. But you say it's not concentrated enough. I Polysaccharides are complex carbohydrates. Yes. And you're talking about how magical they are, all the things that they do. Uh, protein has been has been given this great seat as the most amazing macronutrient that we need. And fat has also been elevated recently. Oh, we have to have fat and we need protein, carbohydrate and fat, but humans need mostly carbohydrate, complex right. carbohydrate. And you are doing the work to, to learn about some of the amazing things that complex carbohydrates do. I'm sure at some of your lectures, your uh, low carb people are like rolling their eyes and um, of course, uh, not very happy with what you have to say. That's right. But I'm just curious about the people who are eating a high complex carbohydrate diet, whole food, plant-based versus people on a standard American diet. Because when we're getting it naturally in the foods that we eat, maybe we're not as susceptible to some of these chronic diseases as those people who aren't getting it on a regular basis. So these supplements that you've created, are they more beneficial for the people who don't eat as well versus those who do? Or you well, probably don't even know that at this point because the the tests have been, you haven't done enough tests. Right. Well, that's, that's a great question. And that's a great point. I, I, would, I would just answer that by saying that, um, as you know, based on your own history and and your belief in food, like me, I mean, we're pretty much kindred spirits here. I would say that the, um, you know, the concept of needing supplements also should be couched in in the sense of you can't supplement supplement your way to good health, right? I mean, you still, regardless of how beneficial these polysaccharides are, and and by the way, I didn't mention this before, we're only talking like at most a few grams per day. So for the keto people, the people that you know, are all into ketosis and, you know, this idea of staying in fasting mode and whatnot. Really, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of people ask me like, oh, is it going to break my fast? Do you think one gram or two grams of material is enough to break a fast? No, it's not. But anyway, I, I think it's important to to mention just so that people don't get misled. I am I'm absolutely not saying you can just eat the standard American diet take these supplements and then you're okay. I, I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am saying is that food is our foundation, but we can use these polysaccharides and B12 and D and maybe even a couple of other things to take us to the next level, right? To, to take us up from just being okay or just being at some nominal level to taking us up to an optimal level. And, and you know, like you say, I mean, I think the other, where you were sort of implying is that what do we know about prevention, right? I mean, unfortunately, there's not really a great way to know if we can pre prevent cancer or heart disease or diabetes or whatever till we get to the end of our life. And then we hopefully just expire. And we didn't expire from all those things. We just expired because our cells stopped le replicating. I mean, that'd be the ideal goal for all of us. But what I can say is that based on what we've published so far, and again, we're still publishing, even though as a businessman, I'm not really 
academic publishing is not really my, probably not even in my top 10 of priorities at the moment, but nonetheless, I still want people to appreciate and value the, the science base that I have to my work. But based on everything we've published so far and that we will continue publishing is if you can keep your immune system surveillant and functional and at a high level, and you can keep your inflammation calm down, your oxidation calm down, uh, if you can impact some of these other things that I'm hoping we'll get funding for in the future to do more research, then we know that, I mean, just by, you know, putting all these links in the chain together through other things that other scientists and investigators are publishing, we know that will prevent stuff like that. So it's just a no brainer, no pun intended, that if you can do all these things to keep, you know, different components of your major organ systems functioning, and then you can actually show that in the blood, well, just again, by default, you would say, okay, well, this makes you very resilient against, again, cancer, heart disease, neurodegeneration, metabolic problems, hormonal problems. I mean, there are a lot of things that go into that, of course, and nutrition is not just the only thing. It's number one in my list and of, you know, how we uh, protect ourselves, but, you know, environmental exposures and exercise and not using tobacco and limiting alcohol, if not completely avoiding it, sleeping well, managing stress. I mean, there are lots of different behaviors that go into this. But again, if, if, if through what we're showing in our published research, that gives us a great opportunity to like hold this really solid shield against all these threats. I have a question about rice. Okay. I love rice. I love brown rice. Sometimes we make a mix of brown and red and black rice, mm -hmm. but there's arsenic. Sure. How do you feel about that connection with arsenic in rice? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a question that people um, uh, ask occasionally. We do third party testing in, in our, um, you know, for our product to make sure that there's never a, a, a too high of a level. You know, it's always within normal limits. Um, I think one of the things you have to look at is, okay, you're taking in something that's potentially bad for you. To my knowledge, and I, and I have to do a little bit more research on this, I don't know how efficiently it gets absorbed into the fatty tissue, which is, is where a lot of these heavy metals and chemicals and other synthetics end up getting stored somewhat in the brain and other organs, but mostly it's in the fatty tissue. So I don't know, you know, how efficiently it does that. But what I do know is that if you're taking in things like citric acid, for example, citric acid is a one, it, not only is it, is it a component in the Krebs cycle of, of helping the cells create energy, but it's also a very efficient chelator of all this bad stuff that we get exposed to in the environment. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, eating your, your citrus, obviously, and your fruits and vegetables, making sure you're getting plenty of citric acid and, and helping to detox from that or, or from, um, you know, pulling chelate, in other words, chelating that out of your tissue is one of the things that you can do for that. There's a, a component in, uh, in our product that we call, or the, I I'm sorry, I don't call it, it's called uh, ultra terra clay. And it's another thing that's got a lot of fulvic acid in it that also is a potent chelator of these different things like arsenic, PCBs, PFAs, all these other chemicals that are floating around now in the environment. So I don't know if I'm necessarily doing a great job of answering your question. I mean, obviously it's a problem, right? And we want to avo avoid it as much as possible. So perhaps one of the best solutions as much as you can is to eat organic. Uh, theoretically, you, your organic brown rice and red and black rice should be not as high in arsenic content as say a, a field that's grown conventionally. And I, I know myself, I mean, our, in our household, we try to buy 90, 90, 95% of the foods that we buy are organically raised. What, you know, whatever that means at this point, I don't know, but, but that's, um, you know, again, looking at one, buying organic, two, consuming other things that are known natural chelators to help pull that stuff out of the body, I think are probably the two best ways that you can help to prevent that um, contamination and exposure over time. That's the way the world works. And the body does do a pretty good job of eliminating toxins. Right. The problem is with many people, they're overloading their body with too many toxins and the body just right. kind of gives up its vitality and, and just 
that's it can't right. deal. So it that's right. Kind of collects it and tries to tuck it away safely. And mm -hmm. there's only so much it can do. So I think the the key is to eat the best we can organic, as you mentioned, plant, and that will eliminate most of the toxins that we consume. And then on top of that, we can take vitamin D, B12, and perhaps some other supplements. And I, so do you recommend this brain product for everyone or for people that are concerned about Alzheimer's or for people that already have it? Who's it for? Daily Brain Care, uh, the product that that came out of all this research that we did on Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. I mean, certainly, again, if you have some sort of a brain issue, I mean, the, the product is named Daily Brain Care for two reasons. One, because of the, the research that we conducted, we have our own research supporting the claims on the label. And these are not disease claims. Again, these are structure function claims that the cells, you know, again, it's whether it's talking about the way it creates a, a glycoprotein, a glycolipid, but to answer your question very quickly, I would say that anybody can benefit from this. I mean, I've been on it for over a decade. My mother's been on it over 15 years. My wife's been on it since our daughter was pregnant. Our daughter turns four this month. When we introduced solid foods to her, who's vegan, by the way, too, of course, uh, we started introducing solid foods to Angie when she was six months old. She's going to be four in a couple of weeks. This girl's brain is unreal, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but. I would tell you that based on, you know, what I said a few moments ago, that because no one gets these polysaccharides from food, you don't just have to have a brain health issue or a brain health concern to benefit from them. So don't be fooled by the label. Daily brain care is just, again, simply uh, respecting the research that we conducted, making our own claims, plus the fact that all these brain health issues, literally from cradle to grave, where you look at the conventional perspective or you know approach to these things and you say well there's really nothing to help me you know right like there's nothing that's very efficacious so we chose daily brain care for the name to target uh, that group of or segment of society or segments of society but i could have named this anything daily heart care daily liver care daily immune care daily skin care because again the cells don't care what is named on a label it cares what you put into your mouth and can it benefit from those so Again, in my humble opinion, I think we can all benefit from these polysaccharides, not just because you have one condition or an issue, but because you want to prevent having these things in the first place. And I, based on what I just told you from, you know, again, a six month old all the way up to an elderly person and all of us in between, our cells need proper nutrition to function. It doesn't matter how old we are. And, and again, as I mentioned, my wife was taking them during her pregnancy as well. So there's no concern for women who are pregnant either. Dr. John E. Lewis, thank you so much for sharing this hour with me, sharing your passion and your experience and your discoveries. It's very exciting and I wish you a lot of luck with all of that and thank you for helping people get better. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. I'd be happy to be on your show anytime. Okay, well, it sounds like you've got a lot of things to talk about, so perhaps yes. <laughs> we'll schedule another talk sometime. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you again. Thank Be you. well. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Well, I really enjoyed that. I hope you did too. I learned things. That's one of the reasons I do this podcast, not just to share all kinds of information, but there's a selfish part of me that likes to learn new things about nutrition. And it's so exciting when we find out things that can really benefit us. And as I mentioned while well, speaking to Dr. John Lewis, he's got a lot of passion and a lot of knowledge, and I appreciate and respect that. So you may want to visit his website, which is called Dr. Lewis Nutrition. I'll link it in the podcast, drlewisnutrition.com. Maybe you want to check out his product, and if you do, let me know how it works out. You've been listening to It's All About Food. Yes, it is all about food. Who gets it? I get it. Do you get it? Well, you're listening. You get it, right? It's all about food. And there's so many wonderful things we can do when we make informed food choices. And before I go, 
I just want to mention Pi Day is coming up March 14th, right? 3.14. Well, ahead of Pi Day, I just made a pie yesterday because I was in the mood for pie. But I made not just any pie. I made a raw pecan pie that I've been making for about 10 years now. And although my partner Gary DiMatte and I make a lot of recipes and we post them on our nonprofit website, ResponsibleEatingAndLiving.com, this raw pecan pie recipe that I've been making for a long time is actually from a book that I reviewed 10 years ago, Choosing Raw by Gina Hamshaw. I'm going to link the recipe in this podcast if you want to try it. It's one of the easiest recipes to make. There's no baking. It's just processing a bunch of delicious plant ingredients, nuts and dates, coconut, a few spices like cinnamon and nutmeg. And it makes this beautiful pie that is so sweet, so sweet and so rich. And it's just whole plant foods, nature's candy dates. You can't eat a lot of it because it's so rich and satisfying. I'm excited about it. So I'm going to share it with you today. And maybe you'll enjoy it. I hope you do. You've been listening to another episode of It's All About Food. Thank you so much for joining me. You can find me at responsibleeatingandliving.com. Send comments and questions to info at realmeals.org. Everybody have a delicious week. <music>